have with us Lauren Schroeder. Um, uh, her title is there on the board. It's called Diversity Within the Homo Lineage. And um, please join me in welcoming her. Okay. Thanks, everyone. So uh, good afternoon. Um, I am uh, very, very excited to be here, happy to be here. And uh, thanks to the BEC for, for inviting me to, uh, to LA to, to uh, give this talk. So um, in light of, of recent hominin fossil uh, discoveries, today I will be speaking about skull diversity within the Homo lineage with a particular focus on the quantitative, um, or particular focus on quantitative microevolutionary approaches to the study of, of human uh, morphological evolution. So I purposely kept this title quite broad uh, to reflect the work that I did for my, for my PhD research um, with the subtitle reflecting the work uh, I, or the methodology that I use for my PhD as well as my postdoctoral work and also uh, uh, future endeavors um, at, the, at the University of Toronto where, where I just uh, recently, recently took up a position. So let me just begin by summarizing the main points that I will be covering today. Uh, so first I will provide some, some background about the discovery of fossil members of the genus Homo, so of our genus. Um, I will talk about what we know about the genus Homo uh, from its discovery uh, as well as uh, its formal definition um, and then also some questions which frame its history. I will then go into some current research uh, and new discoveries which have, um, which have shaken up our views on what we previously thought we knew uh, about the genus Homo and, and what we know today. After that, I will describe uh, the main methodology, uh, or sorry, the main objectives um, of my research and uh, um, as well as the data that I've collected and also methodology that I employed uh, to uh, tackle questions about the evolutionary relationships between uh, species. Um, then I'll discuss some, some results uh, from that methodology and that, those approaches. Um, and then also, so that's mainly a focus on my PhD dissertation, but also follow up papers which, and, and then also discuss what these results mean in terms of, of the bigger picture. Um, and then I'll finish off, off if I have a bit of time by, by talking a bit about uh, my postdoctoral work um, that I, I uh, did at the University of, um, or that I undertook at the University of Buffalo um, with Dr. Noreen von Kramen Taubadel. Um, and then also how the intersection of all of this uh, uh, relates to a new project that, that I, uh, I'm starting at the University of Toronto. Uh, hopefully um, soon. So for, for most of the past uh, half a century, human evolution has been viewed um, as, a, as a linear process where ancestors and descendants are connected uh, in a way where one you know, evolved into the, the other uh, with paleoanthropological research mostly focused um, on, on uh, taxonomic classification and, and pattern. However, as our understanding of the complexity of population variability has grown, this simplistic view has been replaced by a more sophisticated understanding of the bushiness of the human tree. More specifically, uh, recent fossil finds and the development uh, of new quantitative methods for looking at the fossil record um, has given us an interesting alternative um, to the traditional linear view of the evolution of, of our genus Homo with a scenario that, that used to look like this, um, moving towards something that looks, looks more like that. So to begin, uh, I will ask the following question. So how does one define the genus Homo? So this question usually forms the basis for any kind of, of traditional paleoanthropological endeavor directed at our genus. But the answer to this question is certainly not straightforward uh, and the definition itself has been amended uh, many times. Now historically, Homo was characterized by a set of morphological traits. So increased brain size and complexity, language, the ability to produce and use stone tools, the possession of an opposable uh, um, thumb and precision grip, uh, a dentognathic reduction, which basically just means flatter face and smaller teeth, and also enhanced bipedal characteristics. However, this checklist of traits does not remove the difficulty researchers face when classifying homo specimens. 
And this is because the morphological overlap uh, during the transition period characterizing early HOMO is substantial, making it difficult to, di to distinguish uh, late osteopath from an early HOMO individual in the fossil record, as well as, as uh, early HOMO from, from HOMO erectus. We also know from recent fossil finds um, and stone tool discoveries that our previous attempts to define and confine HOMO to a specific suite of, of characters um, uh, like those um, at a specific time and place is, is questionable. So what do we know about the origin of HOMO? So we know that the genus HOMO first appears in the fossil record just shy of three million years ago. Um, so the recently discovered mandible from Lady Guraru in Ethiopia pushed back uh, the first appearance of homo-like morphology from 2.5 to, uh, to now to about uh, 2.8 million years. Also on the slide you will see uh, uh, some other uh, pre-2 million year old um, specimens <laughs> such as the Ura mandible from Malawi, uh, the Hadar maxilla from Ethiopia and the Shemron temporal from uh, Kenya. Although there has been some disagreement amongst researchers uh, with regards to the classification of these specimens as HOMO, um, there has also been an increasing recognition uh, that the evolution of HOMO was multi-branched and, and bushy. So this bushiness and, and wide morphological variability, coupled with the discovery of new fossil specimens, have provided further insight into our current understanding of early HOMO but have at the same time led to new questions and debates relating to how these species uh, are connected. So questions, questions such as, you know, how many species are in our genus? Where would the ancestor of Homo come from? Come from? Um, what, would have had, what would it have looked like and when would it have lived? Um, dominate the research into, into the origin of Homo. And these questions and debates have in turn led to a number of studies that focus on teasing apart within and between species variation. However, the relationships remain ambiguous and issues still remain largely unresolved. And the unclear boundary and morphological overlap that exists between Australopithecus and Homo that I, that I also mentioned earlier amplifies this problem, making the study of ancestor-descendant relationships a, dip, a difficult task. So it's well known that paleoanthropology is a dynamic field of study and that issues uh, which relate to fossil hominin diversity define but at the same time plague the field. And since the beginning of you know, my, my PhD research up until maybe a few weeks ago, our, our understanding of human evolution has changed with new discoveries being made and also new research being done. And this is especially the case when one looks at our own genus um, and uh, has become even more apparent with the discovery of two new hominin species uh, from the cradle of humankind in South Africa, um, Osteopithecus sediba and Homo naledi. And, two, and these, both of these discoveries I've been fortunate enough to, uh, to be part of. So I'll begin with Osteopithecus sediba. So this species was identified from fossil remains found at a site called Malapa, just outside of Johannesburg um, in South Africa. The site is described as a natural death trap and contains the fossilized remains uh, of many types of different types of fauna, including extinct bovid, uh, cats um, and mongoose, as well as the hominin individuals. So the announcement in the journal Science um, in 2010 was was huge, not only because of the remarkable preservation of so many skeletal elements from two different uh, individuals, a, a juvenile and, a, and an adult, but also because <laughs> of the mix of Homo and Australopithecus uh, traits um, that have never been seen before in a, in a species. So these, these Sediba specimens really intensify the debate about how we distinguish um, an early specimen of Homo uh, from an Australopithecine in the fossil record. And with the recently revised age of uh, approximately two million years uh, old, this find is even, uh, becomes even more intriguing. So there have been a number of articles published in science since then, including analyses and descriptions of the foot, locomotion and gait, lower limb, pelvis, uh, thorax, upper limb, 
um, hand mandible as well as uh, the endocostal brain um, of, of uh, Sediba, all providing a complete uh, but rather complex picture of, of the species anatomy. So just to give you a few results uh, from some of these analyses. So the authors of the, the endocast paper uh, used uh, cutting edge 3D scanning technology to produce a digital endocast um, of the juvenile skull, uh, which showed an unexpected uh, um, complex brain structure for such a small cranial capacity. The two articles describing the hand and foot of Sediba all uh, point to a mixture of homo and osteopathicus uh, like traits. And a significant finding in these uh, papers is that Sediba had a surprisingly modern hand whose precision grip um, led uh, some of the authors to suggest uh, that it may have been a tool making osteopathocene. Similarly, the pelvis and the lower limb of Sediba showed a number of mixed traits, uh, more notably the derived traits shared with later HOMO for more efficient bipedal locomotion. However, the upper limb, thorax and vertebral column uh, display traits re uh, um, re relating to more ef uh, efficient arboreal climbing. So as for the skull, uh, both the cranium and the mandible showed a number of mixed homo and osteopathicus traits. And in the mandible paper uh, that I was, was a co-author on, uh, we used Euclidean distance matrix analysis to assess the growth trajectory um, of the mandibles from juvenile to adult. So on the slide, you, you see a principal coordinates uh, a plot of average shape for juveniles um, and adults of various species, um, and then this is the, the Sediba trajectory. Um, and what it shows is that in terms of the magnitude of growth, Sediba differs from Osteopithecus africanus, Homo erectus, um, humans and chimpa chimpanzees, with Sediba uh, displaying a greater amount of, of shape change from juvenile to adult than any of these other species. But we also look at the pattern or direction of growth in Sediba, um, and that is more similar to what we see in, in Homo erectus, so this one over here, um, and that uh, may indicate a, cl a closer connection between Sediba and Homo. So because of the wide range of mosaic uh, features exhibited in both cranial and postcranial morphology, uh, the species has been described as ancestral uh, to late, later species of, of Homo. But the authors of the, of the original publication, uh, Lee Berger and, and co, suggesting that Sediba may be a transitional species between Southern African uh, um, Australopithecus africanus and either Homo habilis or later Homo erectus. However, there have been some opponents to this view uh, who maintain a more traditional view um, of the human tree, suggesting that the fossils uh, could be a late Southern African branch of Australopithecus coexisting with members of the Homo genus. genus sorry. But we cannot disregard the derived um, Homo-like characters of Sediba. So what would it in fact mean if, the best, if it is in fact the best candidate uh, uh, for the ancestor to Homo? And what would the possible uh, evolutionary scenarios be? So firstly, if Sediba is indeed the ancestor of early Homo, it could mean that the earliest Homo specimens, uh, such as the 2.8 million year old mandible from, from Ethiopia, are not really Homo. Um, another possibility could involve placing Sediba within Homo, um, and uh, given the derived traits shared between Sediba and, and Homo specimens. Alternatively, uh, Sediba could be an evolutionary dead end, evolving independently from Homo, um, and uh, a good case of, of parallel evolution. On the other hand, if we do accept the idea of multiple species in early Homo, Sediba could have given rise to a later, later species um, uh, of Homo, introducing the possibility of multiple origins. And finally, it could be that a much uh, earlier population of Sediba became isolated, evolving independently uh, and giving rise to Homo. 
So it's evident from all of these scenarios uh, that there are multiple possibilities. Um, so how, how on earth do we, do we tease them apart? Now, before I, I get to how I address that specific issue, I will discuss another recent fossil discovery. Um, and I'm sure many of you have heard about this one. So fossil material from the Dinaledi chamber um, of the Rising Star cave system in the Cradle of Humankind in South Africa was first discovered in October 2013. A single 0.8 by 0.8 meter square uh, pit, uh, 20 to 25 centimeters deep, was excavated, uh, yielding approximately 1,550 skeletal fragments. So these specimens, these fragments also include uh, six bird bones and a few fragmentary rodent remains. However, the overwhelming majority of specimens uh, belong to a single species of, of hominin, classified as uh, Homo naledi. Um, so in South Africa, uh, in the South African Sutu language, naledi means star. So in 2014, I was very fortunate to be chosen uh, to be part of the research team um, and to participate in the Rising Star Workshop, where I was uh, part of a group of, of mostly early career scientists who were tasked with describing the fossil remains from the site. Um, and, and this is what we found. So the fossil material recovered uh, is morphologically homogeneous so, uh, um, and represents nearly uh, every element of the skeleton from multiple individuals. So to date, the published dental remains point to a minimum number of individuals of 15, um, and, uh, but this is, uh, is specific to this particular chamber. Um, and these individuals range from, from babies to old adults. But as I said, it's specific to this particular chamber because uh, uh, recently there, has been, uh, there have been excavations in other chambers uh, in, this, in the system where they found more individuals, um, but most of it has not been published yet. Um, so all fossils in the initial description were excavated from two stratigraphic layers, units two and three. And the fossils themselves are very fragmentary, with many of them presenting dry bone uh, fracture patterns, which may be due to post-depositional uh, sediment move movement in the chamber. Uh, and or directly related to the fact that the, the cave has been open to, to cavers for, for many years. Uh, none of the bones showed evidence of antemortem or perimortem fractures. So how did these individuals get into the chamber? So this ans the answer to this question um, has been uh, in the media quite a bit. Um, but has also been hypothesized uh, by the authors of the initial ge uh, geological context paper. And the answer that I think um, is that we, we don't know. So the confusing depositional evidence we have, um, i.e. You know, no associated fauna, a large number of individuals with a wide age range, no evidence for occupation of the site, no death trap uh, or mass fatality, no evidence for water transportation, and no evidence for large uh, carnivore uh, predation. Um, all of this evidence is unlike anything we've, we've seen previously in the fossil record. Um, and we also know that the chamber itself uh, is very remote and difficult to enter. So the schematic on the slide uh, shows a cross section through the cave. Um, and the, the chamber itself is 30 meters below ground and accessing it involves uh, a crawl through a very narrow horizontal um, a passage or access point called the, the Superman's Crawl, um, which is 25 centimeters at its narrowest. Um, then an exposed 15, meters cli a 15 meter climb from the bottom of the dragon's back, um, which is just a, a big dolomite um, uh, uh, rock um, or block, and then uh, over down into a very narrow um, access uh, point, uh, shoot, um, which is 20 centimeters at, at its narrowest, um, and then you, you hit the, the dinner lady chamber. So it's extremely uh, difficult to actually get into the chamber. Um, and a search by a professional caving team and researchers has actually failed uh, to find any other plausible access points to the dinner lady chamber. Um, 
and uh, 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 so there's currently no no evidence to suggest that that an older um, now sealed entrance uh, to the chamber ever existed uh, but with the new re renewed excavations going on at the site there's also a uh, new geologic geological surveys being done to find uh, an alternative entrance. So in terms of the morphology of the fossils, Homina lady exhibits anatomical features shared with Australopithecus and other features shared with Homo, as well as several features uh, not seen in any other hominin species. So this anatomical mix is reflected in different regions of the skeleton similar to that seen in Oceropithecus sediba, but in a completely different combination. So Homina lady combines a Homo erectus-like body size and stature with an Oceropith sized brain, shoulders and hands while suited for climbing, human-like hand and wrist manipulation, um, or wrist adaptations for, for manipulation, Oceropith like uh, hip mechanics, um, with human-like terrestrial adaptations of the foot uh, and lower limb, as well as small dentition with primitive dental proportions. So the species is weird, <laughs> basically. Um, so on to the age of the assemblage. So in the past, I used, I used to uh, use this awesomely funny meme uh, to indicate that the dates of the, of the assemblage were unknown. Uh, but that all changed uh, earlier this year. So in papers uh, published a few months ago, the team in South Africa provided an age range for these remains of between 236,000 and 335,000 years. So this age range was determined from a number of, of different independent dating methods. Um, so these dating methods include optically uh, stimulated luminescence or OSL dating, uranium thorium, paleomagnetic an, uh, analyses of the flow stones, um, as well as direct uh, electron spin resonance uh, dating of, of uh, three homonolady teeth. So they directly dated the teeth. So these dates, uh, you know, 236 to 335,000 years old, um, in, suggests that the species is far younger, or it shows that the species is far younger than its morphology would actually suggest, um, and indicates that, that the species may have shared the landscape with, with other um, hominin species like um, early modern Homo sapiens. Um, although this, this young geologic age does not necessarily mean that the species diverged um, at this time, it could be that Homonoledi represents a long surviving species uh, that diverge much earlier than this. But nevertheless, in, in light of its morphological traits and also this young date, Homonoledi is quite difficult to interpret in a broader evolutionary context. Because where does it fit in? Um, that, did it contribute in any way to our own evolution or was it just a, a dead end? So these important questions are actually being researched as we speak. Uh, but two things that uh, the species does indicate for sure is that the Homo fossil record in South Africa rivals the diversity uh, seen in, in East Africa. Um, and, that, and also that small brains, um, along with Homo erectus-like cranial morphology um, and a combination of primitive and derived postcranial traits persisted into recent time periods um, in, our, in our lineage um, uh, in multiple geographic contexts. So similar to that uh, in the, with the small uh, brained Homo floresiensis um, from Indonesia, which is dated uh, to approximately 100,000 years. So overall, the issues uh, that I've presented in terms of new hominin discoveries and species variability have several important implications. So firstly, due to a number of new fossil finds, the range in brain sizes of homo fossils has increased drastically over the past decade, uh, which challenges the traditional view that a big brain is a diagnostic criterion of homo. Secondly, the mix of primitive and derived traits 
and the relationship between brain size and skeletal morphology differs between groups, with some groups representing uh, a relationship between brain size, um, a, a larger brain size and, and more um, primitive uh, uh, morphology, um, with others displaying the, the complete opposite. And then thirdly, uh, the evolution of early homo in Africa was non-linear and characterized by morphological um, variability in combination with the cultural and behavioral flexibility that we see in the archaeological record. Uh, and lastly, the emergence of homo-like characters uh, across time and space may provide evidence for multiple lineages um, and multiple origins. So it's clear that future research into homo diversification needs to move away from studies focused solely on taxonomic classification and the fixation of specific traits uh, which do or do not define homo. And so this brings me to the crux of, of my research. So as I've mentioned before, in the field of paleoanthropology, the focus in the past has mostly been on teasing uh, apart within and between species morphological variation to identify the affinities um, of different fossil specimens and to determine the, um, the phylogenetic patterns and taxonomic order within our lineage. So I will call this the macroevolutionary approach and it is essentially an inquiry of effect or pattern. In other words, the products of evolution dealing almost exclusively with the, with the classification of fossils. So these kinds of studies uh, have a common limitation which relates to the classif classifying of complex variation that has undoubtedly been created by the interaction of a combination of evolutionary forces. So what's more is that most of these studies are usually rooted in assumptions about evolutionary and mechanistic process which are poorly understood. So for example, uh, when evolutionary process is considered by researchers in paleoanthropology, the rise and fall of, of hominin species is almost exclusively uh, considered a result of natural selection, uh, specifically how well they are adapted to the environment, regardless of whether this assumption has been tested or not. Um, and even though the, the me methodological uh, developments of a number of disciplines, coupled with genetic uh, and morphological evidence from multiple organisms, um, have actually led to a wide acceptance uh, that evolutionary change is driven by a combination of adaptive and non-adaptive uh, forces such as genetic drift and gene flow, there's still a large disconnect between these explanations versus the prevailing adaptationist approach of paleoanthropology. There are other forms of inquiry, however, that are specifically focused on the cause of variation. And this research can be split into three main approaches. So studies investigating uh, functional morphology, studies of uh, developmental biology, as well as studies focused specifically on evolutionary process. And the last one, evolutionary process, is, is the approach that I use in my, in my research. So my main uh, research focus is on expanding uh, our current understanding of the cranial and mandibular variation within HOMO by using an integrative quantitative approach to explore the evolutionary processes that produce the patterns of variability seen during the evolution and diversification of our, of our genus. So the methodology I use is applicable to the exploration of two uh, evolutionary processes, natural selection, which is adaptive evolution as a response to, for example, a change in environment, and genetic drift, which is stochastic, a non-adaptive evolution that is due to, to random chance. So, and although gene flow as an evolutionary process is, is also an important contributor um, to variability in hominin evolution, uh, that was not the emphasis for this particular approach, but I will, I will touch on that a bit later. So, also you may ask why the skull? So, uh, for three main reasons. Um, firstly, cranial and mandibular remains uh, are well represented in the fossil record. Uh, and as a result, a relatively, a relatively large sample size um, can be gathered. 
secondly, the skull contains population-specific morphological patterns, uh, which have been commonly used in investigations um, of variability. And lastly, the evolution of the, of the homo skull is characterized by, by a number of well-documented uh, evolutionary trends, such as brain size increase um, and decrease, and, then, and shifting um, adaptations relating to mastication. Therefore, it has been at the core uh, of many hypotheses relating to, to evolutionary change. So I have predictions of, um, of microevolutionary process being applied to morphological studies in the past. Um, well, this approach has been successfully applied to a number of, of studies um, uh, of extant animals, like deer, mice, uh, um, and most of the New World monkey lineage, such as tamarins, saki monkeys, uh, and squirrel monkeys, uh, for evaluating the evolutionary processes underlying population divergence. However, the opposite is true uh, for extinct species where its application um, has been rare. Um, so a few um, of those applications. Um, so a previous study by Ackerman and Shevred has shown that genetic drift may, may account for facial diversity during the ev evolution of the genus Homo. However, selection may have played an important role in diversifying hominin facial morphology between the Australopithecines and, and Homo. Another study by Weaverman, uh, uh, Weaver, Roseman and Stringer determined that the difference in cranial morphology between humans and Neanderthals um, was largely shaped by genetic drift. And then more recently, my colleagues and I investigated the evolutionary processes necessary to transition from Osiropiths uh, to earlier Homo to address hypotheses relating to possible ancestor descendant scenarios using, using Osiropithecus africanus as a model ancestor. Uh, so more specifically, analyses were carried out to test uh, the hypothesis which I mentioned earlier, that Australopithecus sediba was a direct ancestor of Homo. So the study had, had two major findings. So first, uh, the majority of our results supported the view that genetic drift um, may have played an important role in shaping cranial diversity in human evolution. And second, uh, we demonstrated that selection must be invoked to explain an Africanus uh, to Sediba to Homo transition, while, tran while transitions from um, Africanus to various early Homo sp uh, species that exclude Sediba can be achieved through non-adaptive forces alone. So these results indicate that either an evolutionary path to Homo without Sediba um, is the simpler path, or that, that this pathway involved more reliance on, on cultural adaptations to cope with environmental uh, change. Um, and this, this uh, last point is, is something that, I, that I'm currently um, working on. So I use this the same uh, methodological framework uh, to investigate the evolutionary processes underlying the cranial and mandibular diversity within all HOMO. I also uh, performed a number of geometric, morphometric, uh, and multivariate assessments of diversity, which I won't have time to go uh, through today, but if anyone's interested, uh, you can ask me after the, the talk. Um, and so the, the statistical approach I used is uh, derived from the, the quantitative evolutionary theory of, of Russell Landy, who in the 1970s developed a testable phenotype applicable model to assess the underlying evolutionary processes uh, responsible for uh, obs the observed uh, morphological variation um, uh, in populations using genetic drift as the null hypothesis. So the expectation of the Landy model is that populations diverging under drift uh, um, will present a proportional relationship uh, between um, well, among the between and the within group phenotypic variants um, of the source population. A non-proportional relationship uh, or rejection of drift indicates that, that morphology is too variable for divergence to have occurred uh, through random forces alone and suggests that natural selection may have played an important role. So 
I am going to go through some math for those who are interested. <laughs> um, so according to the, to the quantitative genetic theory, uh, the neutral model of evolution is shown on, by the equation on the slide. So this is where, where EBT um, is the estimated between group variance covariance matrix. G is the within group additive genetic variance covariance matrix. Um, T is the generation time and NE is the effective population size. So a study by, by Jim Shevrid in 1988, um, as, as well as many others since then, have showed that in cases where only phenotypic data are available, um, like in the fossil record, it is possible to substitute the within uh, group phenotypic vari variation W um, for the within group uh, genetic uh, um, variation uh, matrix uh, G as the prediction uh, is that both of that, uh, that these two matrices are, are proportional. Um, and so this basically reduces the equation um, when we, we uh, uh, are studying phenotypes, uh, it, re it reduces the equation to, to a question of proportionality as both time and population size are, are constants for any particular comparison and can therefore be canceled out. So that leaves us with an easily testable null hypothesis, which states that if random evolutionary processes have shaped the diversity um, within or between populations, then a proportional relationship should exist between, uh, um, should exist between the patterns of within and between uh, uh, phenotypic group variation. So this is tested by plotting between group variants among the, the fossil specimens onto a model of within population variants um, calculated from a modern ape or, or human sample. And this is because we can't uh, um, uh, estimate uh, within species populations with uh, just fossils because the sample size is too small. So as I've said before, that if populations have diversified through random evolutionary processes, such as genetic drift, uh, the prediction is that the relationship between the within group um, and the between group um, morphological variants will be directly proportional. Um, and so this is shown in the graph on the right uh, where the slope is equal to one. So what this means is that the pattern of variance within and between these groups uh, are comparable and changes, um, changes in magnitude are mostly due to, to scaling. A non-proportional relationship or rejection of, of drift um, as seen uh, in the graph on the, on the left, indicates that morphology is too variable for divergence to have occurred through random forces alone, and non-random forces, such as diversifying selection, are likely to be at work. So it's, it's also important to note here uh, that just because we can't reject drift uh, does not rule out the possibility that selection has occurred or did occur, but it rather indicates that any effect of selection uh, cannot be distinguished uh, from chance changes uh, caused by drift. Um, and by design, uh, this test makes it difficult to reject drift when sample sizes are small and few taxa are being compared, uh, which will always be the case with fossils. Uh, therefore, um, what this, this means is that it is likely that any indication of a significant uh, departure from pr proportionality will, will indicate selection. So I perform these tests hierarchically to, to focus on the relationships between temporary successive hominins. So first I looked across all of HOMO to test for random versus uh, adaptive divergence. Then I focused in on the relationships between successive species at different levels, as well as different geographic pro uh, populations. So the aim was to determine whether non-adaptive forces were responsible um, for, for the variability in, in HOMO and then also explore possible correlations between these results and, and major evolutionary events, uh, morphological changes, um, and adaptive hypotheses uh, within our genus. So for my data collection, um, I'll just go through this quickly. So I traveled with the next engine 3D scanner to a number of different museums, uh, institutions, and, and universities in South, South Africa, um, Kenya, Tanzania, uh, Ethiopia, um, 
Germany as well as the US. And my final fossil data sample consisted of 189 uh, cranial and mandibular specimens. And mostly all of this consisted of, of original fossils, but I also supplemented them with, with some costs. Um, and uh, these included several hom homo species as well as Ostropithecines to contextualize my sample and also to explore the relationships between these, these different groups. Uh, I collected a comparative data set which totals around uh, 280 crania and 300 mandibles of modern hominoid um, species, including uh, modern humans, uh, gorillas, chimps, and orangutans, which were then used to, to model the limits of within species variation um, uh, in these, these fossil populations. So I collected traditional landmark data from these 3D scans as shown on the slide, um, which were then used to calculate a, a series of interlandmark distances. Um, and these data were then used in a series of tests for genetic drift. So in cases where drift was rejected, uh, I used another aspect of the landing model involving the detection of the effects of natural selection producing the observed differences in populations. So this was done by reconstructing uh, selection vectors which contain information about the magnitude uh, and, uh, and direction of selection uh, to investigate its effects on different regions of the skull. So these models for re uh, reconstructing selection vectors are, are useful for two reasons. So firstly, we, we can use them to estimate the nature of the selection acting to differentiate um, uh, populations. Uh, and secondly, for their ability uh, to shed light on the pattern um, of selection and its resultant morphological response. So this second point is important for understanding morphological integration more broadly as selection on a on one particular trait uh, can affect the divergence of other traits indirectly if these traits are correlated. Um, so I won't have time to go into morphological integration today, but uh, selection vectors are useful. Um, so the following results uh, that are presented in four themes represent a summary of my, of my most um, significant findings. So the null hypothesis of genetic drift could not be rejected in 95% of all cases. So this implies that most of the cranial and mandibular diversity within HOMO is consistent with random evolutionary processes or non-adaptive processes. And this is particularly evident in the neurocranium uh, where all comparisons are shown to be consistent with drift. And what this means is that even though brain size within HOMO is variable, the differences in the pattern uh, of neurocranial uh, shape and size um, uh, during the, or size variation during the evolution of our genus is negligible. However, I will reiterate here that a failure to reject drift does not completely remove the possibility that selection um, has occurred. Uh, but rather indicates that any effect of these processes uh, cannot be distinguished from divergence due to, to random uh, or chance or due to drift. And also the structure of the test makes it difficult to reject drift when few, few traits are being compared uh, because the number of measurements uh, or number of PCs is directly related to the degrees of freedom, um, which means that there's a lack of power. And this lack of power and the, the possibility of, of type 1 errors allows for a very conservative estimate of selection, uh, but not genetic drift. So because of this, it may be useful uh, to, to focus on analyses that have uh, the highest number of traits uh, and therefore relatively high statistical power as well as comparisons with, with uh, very high R squared values um, indicating a good fit to the model. And when this was done, um, I still found that for the majority of cases, uh, drift could not be rejected. Um, it went down to about 75%. Um, so overall, what this is saying, um, it, or what this is questioning, uh, is the tradi traditional view that selection was the main evolutionary process, um, or the only evolutionary pro process, acting on, on uh, uh, 
diversity um, or skull diversity within HOMO. So the second theme relates to HOMO naledi. And because we don't know for sure uh, where HOMO naledi fits on the human tree, tests will be performed between naledi and both early and later hominins to account for different divergent states. And the results show that the null hypothesis of genetic drift cannot be rejected in all comparisons, regardless of the hypothetical evolutionary scenario, implying that the cranial and mandibular morphological diversity between Homo naledi and other Homo uh, species is consist consistent with random uh, or non-adaptive evolutionary processes. Now, this doesn't give us any clues uh, as to the possible phylogenetic relationships. However, it could imply that these hominins may represent a small population in isolation over a long evolutionary time frame, because by nature, genetic drift uh, is more effective uh, in populations with, with small population size. So the final two themes relate to the remaining instances where drift was rejected. So firstly, a number of facial and mandibular comparisons between hominins from Dominici, Georgia uh, and other early homo produced a rejection of drift. So these hominins from Dominici are unusual uh, as they represent a single population with extreme variability from the site which preserves the oldest known homo fossils um, outside of Africa, dated to around 1.8 million years. However, interesting, interestingly enough, even though the Dominici group itself is hugely diverse, I found, I found that this rejection of drift is con was consistent across um, all the Dominici hominins, regardless of the specimen or, com or combination of specimens that I used, uh, that I included in each of my analyses. And this indicates that the de detection of selection in this group is not just a product of the group's variability. And this is important uh, as it shows that the pattern of shape covariance across the Dominici specimens is comparable uh, despite the large size and, and, sh and shape uh, range. And this, uh, this result also, also implies that selection was, was likely associated with the first homo dispersal out of Africa indicating that significant morphological changes uh, were necessary as these hominins adapted uh, to different environments. Um, and then the final theme relates to, to maxillary and mandibular shape diversity. Um, and here a, a number of comparisons produced a rejection of drift. And these rejections were detected between later and early forms of homo as well as within the early HOMO group. Um, and when the selection vectors between these groups were assessed, I found that for the maxilla and the mandible, the, selection pre the selective pressures and resultant morphology acts in a, in a manner that is consistent with our current understanding of hominin cranial and mandibular diversity and may relate uh, to dietary shifts and masticatory adaptations, uh, with smaller jaws being selected for during the evolution of, of early homo. So what does this all mean? Um, and what are the, the implications? So far in this talk, uh, I've outlined a number of issues, uh, as well as shortcomings, uh, which characterize the study of morphological variation in the, in the human fossil record with particular emphasis on, on the genus Homo. And as I've shown, the difficulty of classifying species within a diverse fossil lineage is only one aspect, one aspect of a much larger challenge, challenge impeding our efforts to decipher complex evolutionary relationships. And essentially this challenge uh, relates to a lack of a deeper understanding of the processes driving phenotypic change as evident in the dominance of adaptive assumptions in the paleoanthropological literature. The approach that I've used provides a potentially powerful tool for understanding uh, the complexity of morphological evolution uh, by evaluating the processes responsible for the phenotypic patterns observed in the fossil record, uh, shifting the current view of hominin evolution from one that's purely adaptive uh, to one that, that encompasses uh, a large range of, uh, or a range of evolutionary processes. 
So I'm going to end my talk um, by just um, discussing some more of my recent work uh, using this, this microevolutionary approach uh, to morphological divergence. So during my postdoc uh, at the University of Buffalo under the guidance of, of Dr. Noreen von Kramen Taubadel, I focused on cranial morpho morphological uh, variation in human uh, and non-human primates. And our main project, which has just been published in the journal Evolution, uh, investigated the evolution of the hominoid cranium by using quantitative genetic techniques um, similar to, to those that I, I, um, I spoke about uh, previously to explore the evolutionary processes responsible for the morphological divergence um, in uh, the crania of, of extant apes. So even though they are extant, and so we, we have a ton of genomic uh, uh, evidence um, in terms of, of the evolution, um, that has identified um, very strong natural selection acting in the great apes, uh, as well as a, a rapid, um, a rapid adaptive radiation in the lesser apes. Uh, our study was the first pure, uh, purely phenotypic uh, study to investigate the potential evolutionary processes underlying uh, this, the variability in the crania of this, of this lineage. And essentially what we wanted to do was to, de to, to determine if the morphology matched what we were seeing in the, in the genomics. So because the tests that we performed uh, required assumptions about ancestral and descendant forms, and because the hominoid fossil record is sparse, uh, we estimated um, hypothetical morphological ancestors uh, within a known phylogeny for exploring evolutionary processes along branches. Uh, and then these ancestors were then used to calculate rates of evolution along each branch of a fully resolved uh, phylogenetic tree. Uh, and these rates of evolution were, were uh, um, calculated um, uh, using Landy's generalized genetic distance, um, which, can, uh, which I won't have time to go through today, but um, it's basically, it can differentiate between divergence due to stabilizing selection uh, di uh, directional selection as well as um, genetic drift. So overall our results showed that the, the evolution of the hominoid cranium was largely characterized by strong stabilizing selection and that mirrors what the, genomics, the genomic data has found. Um, there are actually two cases where genetic drift could not be rejected um, which is shown in blue um, and then two instances where directional selection was detected um, and all the other um, instances are stabilizing. So the two instances where we, uh, where we detected um, uh, directional selection uh, was, uh, uh, was detected uh, during the divergence um, of Homo sapiens from its ancestor with Pan um, as well as the gibbons from its ancestor with, with the great apes. So in the case of these two directional uh, selection branches, we also analyzed uh, the vectors and responses of this selection to identify the exact traits um, that were responsible for this divergence. Um, and uh, if uh, you guys want to find out more about that, you can also ask me afterwards because it's long and complicated and we should be done soon. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I'll just say that, that in, in those two cases, the selection uh, vectors indicate that selection on basic cranial flexion, uh, cranial vault expansion, and, and facial retraction characterizes the divergence of HOMO, whereas the divergence of the lesser apes was uh, defined by, by selection on neurocranial size um, reduction. So up to this point, I've only really addressed uh, the work I've been doing related to the relative roles um, of genetic drift uh, and selection um, underlying morphological divergence. However, there is another evolutionary process uh, that has played a large role in our evolution, uh, and that process is, is gene flow. So hybridization and resultant gene flow is fairly common in mammals. Um, 
and it occurs about uh, in around 10% of, of all taxa um, and therefore has played a significant role in shaping diversity. However, despite uh, increasing awareness of, this, of the prevalence of hybridization, our understanding of the effects of this hybridization on the skeleton is, is minimal. The need for more information on the effects of hybridization on the skeleton has, has been highlighted in, in the last few years as more and more evidence uh, for gene flow in human evolution has emerged uh, with the proliferation of, of ancient DNA studies uh, such as this one by Coolwim uh, et al. Uh, published in Nature. However, ancient DNA can't really tell us much about what our archaic ancestors uh, and their hybrids looked like. Um, also, it can't really give us much information about hominin species uh, that are too old for the preservation of, of any ancient DNA. And so the, for this, we must uh, gather, gather data on the effects of hybridization um, on the skeleton in order to be able to interpret uh, the fossil past. And so with this goal in mind, uh, a large interdisciplinary and, and inter-institutional team which I am part of, uh, is investigating the effects of hybridization in the mammalian skeleton. So this team is headed by Professor Becky Ackerman, um, actually my PhD advisor uh, at the University of Cape Town. And this research has, has uh, to date involved uh, studies of pedigreed hybrid uh, baboon skulls, uh, gorillas, uh, wildebeest, as well as experimental studies um, in lab mice with the goal of being able to apply what we see in these living species to develop an approach uh, for identifying hybrids in other taxa, specifically in the human fossil record. Um, and results of these studies so far have been very promising um, because it's shown that these hybrid signatures are ma maintained not only through time within lineages and across uh, generations, but also uh, across widely divergent mammalian taxa. And so building on this ongoing research, I'm currently developing a project to investigate the hybrid phenotype of, this, of the Eastern Coyote uh, or Coy wolf um, and genomic studies of this population have shown uh, that it is a hybrid between coyotes and eastern wolves with some integration from dogs occurring in a natural hybrid zone uh, in northeastern U.S. Um, and also into Canada. And in this population, hybridization has created a novel phenotype uh, that has actually been viewed by some as, as a separate species. And so the main aim of, of this project that I'm starting uh, is to quantify the morphological signature of hybridization uh, in samples of koi wolf skulls um, with matched uh, genomic admixture data, um, which, is, which is currently available, uh, and using, basically using the koi wolf as a model um, of a population undergoing continuous hybridization uh, occurring simul simultaneously between three or more taxa uh, to build upon the ongoing uh, body of, of research into the effects of, of hybridization in, in the mammalian skeleton. Um, so, so yeah, so from early homo to koi wolves, uh, but I'm pretty excited uh, uh, to be starting uh, this project um, and I hope, I hope to be collecting data next, um, next summer um, and hope to have um, some fascinating results uh, to present soon. So, so yes, yeah, so I will actually finish up over there and thanks to all these people and these institutions and funding. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you all for coming and I welcome questions. There's a list of references of papers. Yes. So um, I'm having a hard time getting my head around your theme number one um, about heads. Um, I, I realize the test to apply was pretty conservative, but brains are expensive, right? I mean, this mm -hmm. is a part of the body that takes an enormous amount of our energy budget. Um, 
relatively fragile tissue. Um, how do you kind of reconcile what we know about brains with the lack of any trace of directional selection on, on brain size? Yeah, so, uh, so we were actually talking about this earlier uh, today in, in one of one of my meetings um, I have not thought about it um, that hard actually <laughs> um, my focus was uh, definitely not um, uh, brain uh, evolution uh, while I was uh, doing my my research uh, but it's definitely a question that I've thought about um, I mean the the fact that you are if you think about um, brain size uh, related to I know, technological cultural complexity, um, I think we can say that there is not a one-to-one -one relationship there. Um, and I think that at the moment, that's basically all I'm saying. <laughs> um, but I haven't really, really uh, uh, thought about uh, um, metabolic costs uh, of big brains uh, versus small brains um, in that way. Um, but, but we can talk about that, yeah. <laughs> definitely. In reference to that, I just had another thought. So one of the, <clears throat> one of the other changes I remember learning about is changes in uh, essentially gut efficiency. So it could be that you know, perhaps some change in gut efficiency happened first and suddenly you have these extra resources, I don't know. Yeah, that doesn't change the cost of the brains. It just changes the, the yeah, so brains the, the, equally cost. the allocation of energy yeah. within a system without changing the total energy demands of the system. So, I mean, if there's a part of the system that's expensive, mm -hmm. um, random variation across that across different species would be surprising, right? Because you either have to have your corresponding variation in the energy budget, or you have to have some compensatory adaptation like a more efficient gut, change in diet, and so So, in other words, it's not something that you would expect to be drifting around. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of other features of skeletal morphology which might seem more susceptible to drift than brain size. It, it's an intriguing result, um, yeah. but it's, mm -hmm. it's surprising. No, definitely. It was surprising to me, too, I, I would definitely say. Um, I was not expecting. I thought, uh, um, you know, when I, when I conducted the analyses on, on the neurocranium, I, I thought for sure there would just be, you know, rejections of drift, but, but no. <laughs> I wonder if you could, um, so you and I talked about this a little bit, but I wonder if you could share with people um, what some of the signatures across mammalian taxa of hybridization are that would allow for extrapolation from, say, koi wolves to almonds, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it, you know, small morphology is so different across those that without knowing what the signatures are, it's a little opaque as to what the utility of the comparison is. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so I, I would have loved to go into into more no, more depth uh, with the hybridization uh, um, uh, research um, because it, it's really exciting um, and uh, and you know it, it's new so this is it's never been been studied before which is awesome um, but basically how I started um, uh, working with with uh, my PhD advisor on, on hybridization, um, looking at the, the s s morphological signatures um, in a population of, of hybrid baboons uh, that basically um, were housed at the, the Southwest Foundation in Texas. Um, so it was uh, two parent populations of olive and, and yellow baboons um, that hybridized and uh, we knew the pedigrees of each of the hybrids. We knew if they were F1, backcrossed, you know, F2 generations, we knew the parents. And so what we wanted to figure out was if these hybrids looked different and how they looked, how different did they look compared to, to these parent parental populations. And the immediate thing that we, we um, noticed was that the hybrids, uh, the frequency of, of 
of uh, strange non-metric features in the cranium was uh, um, f uh, occurred frequently in these hybrid populations. So uh, these non-metric features uh, are things like um, supernumerary teeth, uh, extra sutures on the face and the, the neurocranium, um, robust, robusticity. So a lot of these hybrids were transgressive compared to their parents, which means they were just giant compared to the parental populations. Um, uh, and then uh, actually also one that we didn't speak about earlier, but uh, rotated premolars um, was, was, a, was a common um, occurrence. And so um, I collected data on, on these baboons um, and we basically showed that the hybrids um, had a significantly, um, uh, statistically significant um, uh, larger uh, frequency of these um, of these, these uh, non-metric traits, these strange non-metric tra traits compared to, to their parents. Um, and that was the first study that was done on any of these, these mammalian taxa. And then uh, that was, uh, th uh, so um, that expanded um, to um, more baboon populations, but also to uh, uh, looking at, at gorillas, um, as well as uh, wildebeest. So wildebeest um, and uh, some and marmosets, and we were finding the exact same non-metric suite of characters um, in these other mammalian taxa, uh, which which is uh, was awesome uh, to see that. Uh, and then now there's a there's a new project um, uh, where where Becky and colleagues. Uh, in Calgary actually are, are breeding mice. So they're breeding mi mouse hybrids uh, to look at the genomic, um, the genetic, um, uh, um, the genetics underlying this, this strange suite of, of characters um, and also seeing the sa similar type of, of uh, things in the mice. Uh, and so what I want to do with the, with the koi wolves is basically, uh, you know, see if I can if I can uh, uh, identify a similar um, suite of, of characters. Um, there's also metric um, uh, characters or metric analyses um, uh, relating to, to morphological integration. So the hybrids show a lower level of morphological integration than their p parents. Um, and so this is something else that, that um, I'm going to try to look, look for. Um, and this is all to create a model of looking uh, at the fossil record. So can we you know, use living species uh, to create a model to find hybrids in the fossil record? Because, um, you know, yeah, we can use ancient DNA for Neanderthals and modern humans and Denisovans, but, but uh, you know, further back, we don't know. And so, so that's the, the main same point, yeah. Um, back to the hominids. You're, tell me if I'm wrong, but you're comparing variants within populations and variants between populations. But um, isn't it true that we know that there's a strong relationship between brain size and body size, like within modern humans? Is that right? I mean, how, how, do, we, how do we figure out what actual brain size is doing? independent of that. Okay, so, um, so I think that's a question related to allometry. Um, so, so yeah, so this, um, what I was uh, focused on was, um, was mostly a shape um, a variation. So when I talk about um, a shape and size related shape, uh, so that, that's allometry. Um, but there's definitely a relationship between body size and, and brain size. Uh, but when you take out size and you just look at shape, uh, you still get this, this, uh, um, uh, these results uh, from, from these analyses. Uh, so, so, you know, brain size is fluctuating in homo, but shape is too. And so this uh, actually took, this brings me to actually a, a, um, a, an answer or solution to, to what you were saying, um, is we could just be detecting 
uh, genetic drift in shape change through uh, neurocranial shape change through through homo um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be absolute brain size but the the fact is that we are seeing small brains at unexpected times in in the homo lineage and so that that brings in a new uh, kind of I don't know something you know other than than just just these these results so, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, in modern humans, do you have any idea of what correlates with the, the measurements that you're doing in these uh, early, um, I mean, characteristics like intelligence or... or um, yeah, so, <laughs> so I, I actually, I have no idea. Um, no, I, I, I haven't um, uh, looked into the correlation between, uh, you know, cultural complexity or uh, um, uh, social uh, sophistication um, and and these results but but it's definitely something that I that I again thought about uh, I think I think my analyses uh, brought more, more questions than, than actual answers within you know extant humans there's essentially no correlation between but there's still there's a lot of variation in brain size and shape. And there is a lot of variation, but there, there, I, I mean, there, there are no robust correlations with anything like intelligence or the features of behavior or personalities. Uh, you can get a lot of different kinds of people out of a similarly sized or shaped brain. Uh -huh. yeah. Yes. Yeah, in the, um, one of the later analyses you were talking about, the hominoid clade analysis, you said that there was evidence for directional selection in the sapiens lineage, and you said you were able to compute uh, selection vectors for different yeah. aspects of the skull. I wonder if you could give us the thumbnail sketch of what that looks like. Um, so, so uh, um, I don't have a, a picture, but but uh, what we found was that um, there was strong uh, selective. Uh, positive selective pressures acting on, on uh, uh, basic cranial flexion uh, to differentiate uh, uh, the homo lineage uh, from its ancestor with pan. So we're just looking at the divergence of all of these different, um, you know, there, there could be instances of, uh, of genetic drift, gene flow and all of the other things along the, those lineage, but we're looking at the actual divergence and, and what process was involved in, in the divergence. Um, and so for the homo lineage, uh, mostly uh, ba uh, basic cranial flexion, um, and that relates to also um, cranial uh, uh, size, um, um, cranial size increase. Um, so all of these things are, are related, um, as well as facial retraction. So the ba basic cranial flexion is related to, to all of these, these traits. And so the main, the main selection vectors that we found, the, mo the strongest that we, that we found, was, uh, was related to basic cranial flexion. So, just, so, so that, that sounds like that is evidence for positive selection on increased brain size if you're talking about but that's then changing the ratio of different skull features to each other yeah, for so facial reduction and brain size increase, right? Yeah, so, so remember we're looking at modern humans versus chimps and then um, uh, creating a... Yeah, so... Higher human clay. Exactly, so, exactly, so to get more resolution <coughs> um, in, in a, a study like you know, the one that, that, that I did with Noreen, um, we would need to include fossils. Um, and, and that could be a possible future uh, endeavor, uh, but that will give you a, a, you know, a finer resolution um, within these lineages. But, but at the divergence point, uh, we, can, we can say something uh, that directional selection was, was involved. Yeah, and, and also I, uh, I just wanna uh, say that we did find evidence for directional selection in Australopithecines. So, so the, so this, you know, Homo lineage, we have uh, um, uh, evidence for for genetic drift and non-adaptive uh, forces. But in Australopithecines, we we have found quite a quite a bit of evidence related to to natural selection. 
coming back to the neurocranial volume question, um, so you know, you just mentioned that there there's you know, variation in, in volume across across the homo lineage, um, across time, up, up and down, and and I'm wondering whether is is that is the um, directionality in time is that calculated by just date, dating the, the fossils in question? Is it calculated by the classification of the of the fossils as you know as Homo or, or Australopithecine? And I and I guess you know how it you know you mentioned how Nadelli is as, as you know is potentially phylogenetically old, even though it, 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 the, the fossils found are quite recent. And um, so I'm just wondering if if you know it seems like kind of the the um, the strength of the model is dependent on, on how well classified phylogenetically these different Yeah, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a great point. Uh, so, so yeah, so when we, we have, you know, fossils, we, the dates that we have for these fossils are not, are not, you know, divergence dates. They are, you know, occurrence dates. And so, um, so that's definitely something, you know, that, that also needs to be taken into account. Uh, but I will say that, you know, the fact that we're seeing Homo floresiensis uh, with small brains but also sophisticated tools is something that, that is not, that's not expected. Um, and so, and so that, that's basically what I'm speaking, speaking to. Yeah. Um, but, but definitely uh, the, the divergence states versus the actual occurrence states of the fossils is sometimes there's you know big differences between them yeah um, I, I was actually wondering if um, just going back to the model that Clark was asking about with the cross species comparison um, with extant primates I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about how you estimated the phenotypes phenotypic traits of the ancestors mm -hmm. given what you were saying about the sort of sparse fossil record, but also about the relatively high levels of within population phenotypic diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so there are, are a number of ways to to estimate ancestors uh, in uh, using phenotypic data. Um, they called ASEs. Um, so ancestral state estimations, or oh, ASRs, uh, ancestral state uh, reconstructions, and uh, they, you know, the methods differ from uh, ba a Bayesian approach to a maximum likelihood approach um, uh, to a um, uh, one that that uh, assumes multiple variants across a tree. Um, they all. <laughs> I, I didn't realize this when I when I started this pro project, but I, I opened a whole can of worms trying to to do these ancestral um, estimations because um, there's not a lot of uh, um, there's a lot of debate in the field regarding these. Um, what we used was a maximum likelihood, um, which is a, a common. Um, a, ancestral estimation uh, technique, um, which basically takes into account the entire tree, um, but uh, the invariance in the entire tree, but uh, estimates the ancestor based on, on just the two um, uh, tip nodes that you could, you know, you are um, uh, estimating the ancestor for. Um, there's also, so we also uh, used a, a Bayesian um, analysis uh, just to supplement what we were seeing or using when we use the, the maximum likelihood estimate and and it was giving us a, a similar results um, but there's there's definitely multiple ways uh, to estimate these ancestors um, but we just use the most common one yeah yes um, so first thank you really interesting um, one of the questions that I have sort of puzzled over is what the role of selection is in shaping variants around a trait. Um, and so your when you see uh, data which showed directional selection but huge variance in the shapes of those skulls, it was interesting to me because I think it speaks to this issue of like, well, 
how is selection operating on variants? Like, so I, I was just wondering if you could sort of, like, this may be a little outside of the house, but if you can speak to sort of what this says about how selection either reduces or maintains or reduces variance in a particular trait. Okay, so, so that, that question relates to, um, to morphological integration and, and uh, evolvability. Um, so the more evolvable a trait is, the more likely that trait will be um, affected by selection. The bigger, the bigger response it will have to, to selection. Um, and the more evolvable, the less integrated that trait will be with other traits. So, um, so let me just, let me just uh, think about how to answer this. Um, so an, an increase in variance means that uh, selection will, um, it will be more likely for, for selection to actually act on, on, a, on a population. Uh, and so, so, yeah, I don't know, that doesn't answer your question. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's complicated. Um, yeah. but, but there's definitely a connection between, uh, you know, selection pressures um, and, uh, and variance um, and how different traits uh, respond to, to those pressures. Mm -hmm. uh, and that all relate, relates, it relates also to how correlated those, those traits are um, with one another. Um, but, uh, yeah, so... Yeah. In, in the Denisovans, I mean, the, the, the high variance there is, is in facial morphology, which is integrated with skull cranial morphology, but not postcranial, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you potentially have room for variation that is the, the, the grist for natural selection to play with there to the extent that these things can be pretty variable without anything down here being variable. Yeah. Last question? Okay, well, we'll wrap it up and thank you very much.